Today's debate question is, is Biden succeeding as president? Thanks so much, Nuance Bro and Stephen. Given that, Stephen, you would take the affirmative if you want to get us started with a roughly two-minute opening statement, and then we'll give the same to Nuance Bro, and then we'll go right into open dialogue, and then we'll do Ready to go? Yep. <clears throat> Yeah, I would say that insofar as Biden could be expected to succeed, I think Biden has done a pretty phenomenal job in office so far. I think his domestic agenda, passing bipartisan bills, has been really good. He delivered on an infrastructure plan in one year that Trump couldn't get done in four, despite having a historically divided Congress. Um, I think that his foreign policy has gone pretty well so far. The Afghanistan pullout was rough, but he got it done. I think that our presence in getting NATO to support and reaffirm Ukraine and the support that we've given Ukraine has been a phenomenal job on his part as well. And I would say that his general decorum as president in trying to bring us together and unify us instead of constantly being divisive and screaming at people on Twitter has been a pro as well. Um, yeah. All right. <clears throat> um, as far as how Biden's doing, succeeding, um, I think you just look around us, you see inflation's right around 8%. You see deficits are still over well over a trillion dollars. The national debt's over $31 trillion. Um, you know, we see turmoil internationally in Ukraine in particular, which we didn't have under Trump. Um, and, you know, domestically, I mean, for the legislation that he's passed, the Inflation Reduction Act, which doesn't actually reduce inflation, um, it just continues to rack up spending um, and actually breaks some of his promises to not tax those making under $400,000 a year. So I don't think things are going too well uh, under Biden's America. And uh, the, the people tend to agree when you look at the polling that they are not happy with the state of the economy under Biden. You got one right in open dialogue? Okay. Um, the first thing on the Inflation Reduction Act, I don't believe that increased the deficit because I think that was matched with spending cuts, right? I think the uh, Inflation Reduction Act wasn't increasing the deficit at all, the budget deficit. I think it was paired with all the spending necessary. So over 10 years, I believe it was projected uh, by the CBO to do something like $90 billion over 10 years, which is $9 billion a year, which is nothing. Uh, in the well, sure, but I'm just saying it didn't increase the deficit, right? Because part, uh, of the, part of his goal with it was to make sure that it was paired with um, yeah. uh, the budget cuts so that it didn't actually increase the deficit. It's arguably as close to like deficit neutral as you could probably <laughs> yeah. get. There yeah, you go. Well, that's cool. it's not increasing the deficit. Um, he did sure. bring the deficit down from, I believe when he came in for the first year, I think it was $2.8 trillion. The next year was $1.4 trillion. Um, we had big budget deficits, but I mean, we had to spend our way through the lockdown. So I don't know how much more he could have done there. Um, sure, but a lot of those were temporary measures that had to do with like stimulus uh, uh, mm -hmm. and also you know, the, the economy being shut down and things like that. So it wasn't really him bringing the deficit down. It was just the nature of how COVID played out and the policy at the state level and things like that. Yeah, that's kind of true. But I mean, I will, I'll give him some credit for cutting the spending because it seems like people oftentimes are reticent to. Um, so for instance, when we talk about inflation, um, Man, it's really early. <laughs> yeah. Got like two hours of sleep. No, it's, it's good. <laughs> when we talk, so like, um, when we look at inflation first, so this is something that triggers me. Um, people will be critical of, well, of everybody for, for spending because um, everybody wants to claim the other guy spends too much, but when they get in office, they spend like crazy. But it seems like Republicans are especially prone to this. Um, when Trump stepped into office, he inherited like a pretty booming economy from Obama. Obama's economy had been posting all-time highs, I think, since like 2013 in the markets. And when Trump came in, that trend continued and ramped up a little bit more, but he did it on the backs of like massive deficit spending. He did his huge tax cuts, um, which was the only major piece of legislation well, he had. Well, it's not really like deficit spending tax cuts, giving people back money that they already own themselves. Sure, but it, it runs it, up the deficit if you don't meet it with spending Exactly, cuts. but yeah, yeah. He, he, cut, he reduced the income of the federal government, but he didn't reduce the spending at all, right? Mm. I believe before Biden, Trump had the largest budget deficits in the history of any U.S. president. Inflation well, adjusted. Mo mo most of that obviously due to, to COVID. I don't know if most of it was due to COVID. I think it's it's almost hard. entirely due I, I to think COVID. There were, yeah. I think there were some in the early years where he was still deficit spending like crazy um, because he was doing these, like he did his huge tax cut, but he didn't pair it with any spending decreases at all. Yeah, and nothing they, compares to the COVID spending though. Sure, nothing might yeah. compare to it, but I'm saying he did have like three years where he had an opportunity to do something about the budget deficit. Yeah, yeah. He didn't. The inflation rates remained historically low. Um, his spending was insanely high. Um, and then towards the end of his yeah, term, obviously the, um, the coronavirus picked up. But I, I, 
the idea that like Republicans try to throw the uh, deficit at or, or inflation or whatever at Democrats when they have every opportunity to do something about it and they don't because Trump did nothing to deal with inflation. Right. Because he wasn't seeing it well, in his administration yet at all. Not necessarily. I mean, inflation's not just a function of the amount of spending that the government does or the amount of uh, money out there necessarily. It also has to do with the supply, it, like the actual supply of goods and services, production. So production was cut uh, massively, um, you know, obviously in part due to, to COVID and also part due to policy. But uh, supply for the most part in the early days of Trump was actually good. Like we didn't have a lot of problems, supply chain issues, things like that. So inflation was kept down for most of those years, even though there was uh, a lot of record spending and things like that. Uh, yeah, I agree that inflation is like a multifaceted thing. But for a lot of the supply chain issues, like a lot of these are international, right? It's not like the only the United States is experiencing the inflation related to the supply chain issue. I'm pretty sure this is like a worldwide problem. I think even China, I think to, even to today, I think China is still taking like pretty insane measures for locking down whenever the coronavirus happens. Like, sure, but their inflation's like what, like two point something percent. It's not as crazy as ours, and they didn't have the issues at. You know, first of all, they produce everything, so they don't need to import the same amount of stuff like we do. And we had all the backups at the ports. A lot of that had to do with really bad logistics policy uh, that the federal government could have been more involved in and actually managing. But, you know, they were like, oh, well, that's L.A.'s issue. We can't really do anything about it. I think a strong leader, an effective leader could have taken charge and actually, you know, even used the bully pulpit or, you know, they, they have connections at local levels and state levels to get things done like this. Um, you know, because this is not just an issue affecting the port of Los Angeles. This is affecting the nation. And I, I mean, I don't realistically, I don't know how much the federal government could have done to step in and just like alleviate the port issue. Honestly, right. even literally just talking to leaders and saying, hey, uh, how, why do you have this limit where you can only stack uh, shipping containers X yay high when, you know, we know you can actually do way more and this would help alleviate a lot of pressure. I don't or even that. divert ships There's to no like way uh, it was just a matter of stacking more containers on a ship. That was that was a huge part of it, absolutely. It was a huge like No, not huge. on ships in the actual storage areas of the ports. That was that, that's why there was a huge backlog in the actual ocean with these ships that couldn't come into port because they had nowhere to put the actual shipping containers. So you how, I'm curious, what percentage of like all of the backups you think was contributed to by not being able to just stack boxes high enough? There's no I mean, way it's, that it was it's, it's hard to actually put a number on something like that, but that was a huge issue initially. And then they actually did roll back that um, that rule. And then there, there was like, you know, train logistics. There was, you know, trucking logistics involved as well. And then they also had to divert some of it to like the port of Long Beach and, you know, other ports throughout the United States. But um, yeah, I mean, there was there was a lot of issues that the federal government could have absolutely and the Biden administration in particular could have gotten a lot more involved in when it came to logistics. And they just they just weren't uh, in the earlier days. Yeah, I mean, especially from a Democrat leadership, I feel like the Democrats are more likely than not to get involved at the federal level. They have the ability to um, the idea that it was just a simple uh, like aspect of them saying, like, hey, I need you to tr like logistics better. I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm buying that one. Um, I do know that when it came to logistics congestions and everything, one of the big issues was, especially during the coronavirus pandemic, um, you had like this huge transfer of people from spending to services to spending almost exclusively on products because things like restaurants were shut down. People weren't traveling as much to go out to eat. And one of the big early contributors people were saying to inflation was that even if you're not spending as much as you were prior to the pandemic, now all of your spending is going into goods, like importing stuff, buying shit. And the, there was just no possible way I don't think a speech or a tweet by Biden could have like magically fixed all of the uh, logistics like hangups that we're having in relation to uh, the, the unprecedented amount of goods we were shipping into and throughout the United States. Yeah, it was also hours um, work. There was like certain rules, I think, set by uh, the union or something that worked there as far as how many hours they could work and how many people could work on a certain shift operating the cranes and things like that. So that was another contributing factor. Um, what do you think of Biden breaking his promise not to raise taxes uh, on people making under four hundred thousand? I think he still. I think he still reiterated that promise for not doing it under. It was four hundred fifty k, I think, right? Something like that. Yeah. Wait, has he yet? Well, has he what? Has he raised taxes on that? Under yet? the Inflation Reduction Act, yeah. How did the Inflation Reduction Act raise taxes? So, on if you look else? at the um, the JCT, right? The joint. 
it's either JCT or JTC, I can't remember. It's, it's basically like the, the tax version of the CBO, nonpartisan, mm -hmm. supposedly nonpartisan governmental group, and they determined that um, the Inflation Reduction Act actually raised taxes on those making $450,000 on the revenue side, basically saying that it disproportionately affects those um, on the on the on the bottom side, like people making under four hundred and fifty thousand. Disproportionately affects how though, like, th th like federal the, tax so rates so like, it's yeah. not just a matter of tax rates because obviously tax rates weren't physically raised, but when you're raising revenue, that money comes from somewhere in the economy, and they're saying based on their analysis through the various measures of revenue raising throughout the Inflation Reduction Act that it disproportionately affects people making under four hundred and. 50 or whatever the number is. Yeah, I guess it would depend on, I guess, where you're getting that money from. But um, the, I mean, like almost anything. So I know a lot of the Inflation Reduction Act had to do with stuff related to energy. Almost anything related to energy that you're increasing um, or getting more revenue from is probably going to disproportionately impact lower spenders because um, it's a bigger portion it's, of it's the It's always overall. going to be a bigger portion. Yeah. yeah, if you're like a millionaire, you don't spend, you know, 100000 a year on heating or whatever, right? It's always going to be a bigger proportion of a poor person's income. But mm -hmm. in terms of... Um, I don't know if I would say it's a violation of a promise that through like an Inflation Reduction Act, some costs of energy end up going up, and that ends up translating to a tax on people earning less than 450000 a year. Well, if it's part of the revenue raising, and that revenue raising disproportionately affects people making under that amount, and that's where the money's coming from, is that not breaking a promise? I mean, that's what the Joint uh, Committee on, on Taxation Yeah, says. no, I don't, think I, I don't think I would consider that. Um, right. it, it, okay. Like, let's say, for instance, um, so for the, uh, the CHIPS Act, where we're starting to do like local manufacturing, we're getting big investments in local manufacturing and chips or whatever. Um, if we were to place like a tariff or something, or if we were to place uh, some sort of like sanction on a country that imports goods and services to the United States, if poor people bought those services more than wealthy people, would I say that that's effectively a tax on poor people? Well, it depends. Is this like a... It, it, I mean, tariffs are for the government to raise money. It just seems strange that like a tariff or like an increase well, in price. No, no. If, if, you're, if you're doing a tariff and it's on a good or service that, you know, these people, it's a disproportionate part of their income, like tariffs are a tax. And if that tax is disproportionately affecting the poor, like, yeah, that's, that's, that's a tax. Absolutely. Gotcha. Well, I would say that uh, the, the way that I originally saw Biden's promise was he said he wasn't going to raise taxes on poor people. I mean, if you, like, if you yeah. raise gas ta taxes, for example, that disproportionately affects the poor, but you're not literally raising tax rates on, 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 on income tax. Well, but raising the, I think raising the gas tax would be quite literally raising a tax, right? That that's, is, what, that's what a tariff is. What is sure, but like what, like what part of the... Um, what part of the? Uh, I don't. I don't remember all the different well, just revenue. Like I, said, I, I don't remember any tax raises being a part of that. That was like I know there were things in there for. Um, well, the revenue raises. Yeah, but what were the yeah. what were the revenue raises coming from that were disproportionately impacting the poor? I'm I'm trying to remember. I don't remember all the the details on the revenue rate. Did you do you remember what the different revenue raises are? For, um, the, I remember all of the different like uh, like the line items for investment. There was a lot of investment in, like green energy and stuff like that. That's for the spending side, but yeah, on the revenue the raising side. side, do you remember what they were? Uh, no, I have it written down on my phone yeah. somewhere though. But yeah, I don't. I don't remember all the. De I know they took out a lot of the stuff to, uh, you know, appease to like cinema, like the the carried interest uh, uh, loophole. They they took that out, so that's no longer in there. But um, yeah, do we have do we have questions, <laughs> James? <laughs> Yeah, we can actually jump into Q Well, wait, here's a question. I'm curious. Um, Allah says, do you think Trump would do better in regards to spending and inflation than Biden would have now? I mean, that's like a hypothetical. I don't know if we can. It's just, you well, never, sure, you, like, you don't so know. So we had like a midterm now, which was like um, arguably like a referendum on the current administration, right? And, you know, usually when we say this guy's mm. doing a horrible job, generally the argument is that my guy would have done better. That's typically what people go. So do we think that if Trump was in the, this position now, do we think Trump would have done a better it's, job? It's hard to say because, again, you know, you have to look at the makeup of Congress. You have to look up the makeup of the Senate. Would he even be able to get legislation passed out of there because he's a Republican and then the House, uh, you know, being Democrat, the Unless Senate. Unless he had the same majorities that he did when he was a president. For uh, then... I mean, that's like, I, I really don't know. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I, would, I would imagine so. so I would Biden imagine so. He speaks a lot about the deficit. He talks a lot about it. He, like, um, every, I'm, every president talks about the deficit. Trump didn't. Trump didn't do anything. He never talked about he, the deficit? He spoke about it, but he never did anything about it. Right? Well, you said talked about. Sure, but I mean, like, when he. Biden president, hasn't really done much about the, the deficit. The Inflation either. Reduction Act, though, at the very least, that was a bill that was paired with revenue raising mechanisms. <laughs> Dude, it, it did basically nothing. But as it's, far, but it's, it's, it's not going to make a blip in the, in the deficit whatsoever. 
It's, but at the very least, it was deficit. And it arguably what, increases. Trump, what, it Trump, arguably increases inflation. Probably. Did Trump ever? For, for, I don't think that's true. I think most people. Well, the, the CBO well. said it either did nothing or it Neutral even had the to, potential to raise it by like 0.1 percent. Sure. But they also, to be fair, said had the potential to lower it by 0.1 percent. Yeah, which yeah. is. So, but nothing. deficit neutral is better than. So it's not an inflation do reducing. Do you think Trump act. will be passing deficit neutral legislation if he had the opportunity to? Like would you say the uh, tax cuts that most, he passed? Most presidents don't. So sure. I'd, I'd, so I don't I'd, think statistically, Trump, I'd sure. bet on so not. So I think that if Trump yeah. had the ability to pass the same act, I don't think it would have been passed with the revenue raising side of it. I think it would have just done more deficit spending like he did in his administration. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I feel like obviously Biden could always be doing better, but mm. when we're comparing like Democrats versus Republicans, um, I don't think Trump showed any inclination ever to care about the deficit. I feel like he talked about it coming into office, but once he was there, I don't think Republicans said anything about the unbelievable deficits that he was Yeah, that's pretty at. typical. Sure. So, well, yeah. but I, like I said, at least Biden is talking about it, and it seems like he's trying to, to pair some legislation with um, revenue-raising measures instead, which is more than I can say for Trump. But. All right. Do we have, do we have questions? Or? Forgive me. If, first, if you could read out my question, in case it hasn't been discussed already. But in just been focused up here. Have you talked about the student debt forgiveness plan? No. Okay. That would be something I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Okay. So uh, the question is about student debt forgiveness. Um, so Biden did that through executive fiat. Um, it's been struck down in the courts recently. So that's apparently not going through. I believe it was. Was it permanently struck down or was it a temporary injunction or something? Uh, I'm. I mean, it's all temporary because it's all going through the appeals process and sure. everything. But is it was it an injunction or I, I believe it was an in, injunction because those usually like an actual full decision typically takes longer. So I'm, yeah, I believe so it was be an injunction. Until the courts figure out if he actually has the power to yeah. forgive that debt or not. What do you think about the moves towards marijuana? Are we just going to ignore the question? Are we not going to talk about? We're talking about, we're talking about executive. Oh, OK. Yeah, go ahead. Finish yeah, I mean, like, uh, I, I guess we would have to talk about. Like, so he, the original plan, like $10,000, I think there's like an extra 10,000 for people who meet like certain parameters. I think it's 10,000 for most, and I think it's another 10 if you had a Pell Grant. I yeah, think. so, um, I, I mean, I don't think what he did was constitutional uh, through, you know, executive fiat. I don't think it's good policy. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts, Stephen? It um, definitely doesn't help inflation, right? Probably doesn't help inflation. I don't mm -hmm. think that's the only issue that matters in the United States, but I, I, I agree. The, yeah. um, for, I'm personally against student debt forgiveness because fuck college students because they're gonna earn a lot of money anyway. Um, no offense to you guys, but um, I think in terms of like trying to do what he can as president, um, it seemed like it was a pretty popular move. At the very least, he was doing like a limit on the amount of aid given, and he was like restricting the certain income brackets, which I am a fan of if you're gonna do it. I don't like the idea of doing like student loan forgiveness for people that are like doctors or for people in incredibly high earning families. So I like that he tried to restrict it to certain income limits and I like that he tried to give a little bit back more to people that had Pell Grants. So student loans and stuff are something that a lot of presidents have talked about, but nobody's done anything, but he's- But you're nation. generally against it and we agree it doesn't reduce inflation. Uh, it and doesn't it's not, inflation. it's generally Again, not look good at every at single a, policy through the lens. It's generally not good policy. Um, economically, personally, I would say probably not. I don't think I'm a big fan of it. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like, you know, winning popular support and everything, it seems like student loan debt forgiveness is things that a lot of people clamor for, so. Uh, you wanted, you wanted to talk about marijuana or something? Oh yeah, do you think that the executive actions for, and then the new approach to marijuana that he's pushing for, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, I, I, I liked it, yeah. Okay, that was pretty cool. good. Um, I was Trump, not right? a, <laughs> well, I would have, I wished, uh, I wish Trump would have done something like sure. that. But uh, uh, what are your thoughts on his, uh, his gun control actions? Um, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of gun control, generally. Mm. But, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but what about control. the legislation that he passed? Um, which one are we? Are we what the one that actually made it through the House and the Senate that even some Republicans voted for. Which, do you remember what the particulars were of it? Um, there was... Multiple different provisions, for example, when it dealt with background checks, I believed it was like one of those things. You know how they have the three day rule? Like if you if you don't pass, if they don't have an answer coming back within the three days, then the background check just goes. It clears mm -hmm. for people under the age of 21 or 21 and under 21. Uh, they basically extended that period significantly longer just in case for like a Uvalde situation. Mm -hmm. um, another provision was, oh, they changed the, when it comes to private sales, um, which, you know, you can do 
on the federal level without a background check, person to person, but you cannot be engaged in the business of selling firearms, otherwise you would need an FFL and then they yeah. would prosecute you. But they said they changed the definition so now if you do it for profit, which is very kind of ambiguous, but basically if you sell a gun and you're like, oh, well, maybe I need the money, uh, I wanna f you know, sell this and make some money, even if it's one sale in a year, that's now illegal. And it would have to go, you'd have to be like a licensed seller to sell it and they could get you on that, which is criminalizing, I think, a lot of law-abiding citizens, potentially. Is that, um, criminalizing without filling out, so, so if you're a private seller, you basically have to do the 4473 now? Uh, you would have to or? be an F like and there's not even a I don't even think there's a process in a lot of these states that don't have private party transfers that involve going through an FFL like California does. Mm -hmm. I don't even think that process is necessarily there for a lot of private uh, sellers. And they're saying you have to basically be an FFL if you're going to be engaged in the business of selling firearms, which means if you sell one gun even for a profit, potentially that's I believe that's how they're uh, interpreting it. Okay. Is that is that concerning to you? Sounds based. I feel like one of the big criminalizing law-abiding citizens who I feel were, like one of the big because they're not they're not changing the law. It's, you could still sell private party transfer, uh, you know, without a background check. But they're like they've got this weird interpretation. It's like, well, if you do it for profit, like if you post, like, hey, I just made two hundred bucks and I bought this originally for you know two hundred dollars less, like you could be criminally prosecuted. I'm guessing they're having trouble closing the private sale loophole completely, or they can't get enough people on board with that. Yeah, but I, I mean, think. like, why? Like that's kind of a shady way to go around it now. Sure. Well, I mean, it's, it's you do what you can legally, right? If whatever uh, but, you can. but generally, I, I know you, like, you're like you not for criminalizing law-abiding citizens because of something they do and like, oh, I didn't even, like, I, of, cor of course you sell something, like you're trying to make money on it, but it's not like you're in the business, you're selling one gun, you're now considered in sure. the business of selling firearms. I think the only, the, like, when it comes to gun control, the only thing that I generally broadly support, or one of the things I generally broadly support is I feel like there should be better tracking for person-to-person -person sales. Mm -hmm. um, if they can't mandate that an individual citizen fills out the ATF forms um, to actually do the sale for the federal background check, then I mean, like, finding other ways to kind of, like, hamper those transfers, I think is okay. I'm not like a, I don't think... I'm trying to think of like how many people are negatively impacted in the United States because of trying to sell a firearm that would get caught under this. I feel like it's a pretty low number. Well, getting caught, so that's the issue. It's getting caught, right? So there's plenty of people who sell firearms every single day in yeah. this country without a background check. How many are caught? Like, I don't know. But like the problem is- you Or know, well, you, you can sell privately without a background check, right? Yeah. But there's also like, there's other um, federal restrictions in place. Like you can't sell, I, I, I'd actually be curious in those numbers. You're not allowed to sell a firearm and it's not allowed to have one. Right? Mm -hmm. Like if you were a felon and I knew that, I couldn't Knowingly. That. Knowingly. Yeah, but knowingly, yes. Yeah. So like how many people actually get prosecuted under that? I'm curious. <laughs> because how, like to prove somebody... I mean, how many, how many people get prosecuted just for lying on a background check form of 4473? Basically none. Sure. It's, it's very few. Even though we have, they always cite the crazy number, oh, this many people got denied a background check and this is how many lives were saved. It's like, no, they don't even prosecute any of these people. Why? Right. But if you, at least if you fail it, you don't get the gun, right? <laughs> well, a lot of those are initial denials. They're not necessarily sure. uh, actually prohibited people. So you're actually, this is like a prior restraint on exercising a fundamental right. Sure. I, I'm generally in favor of like the sides coming together and doing some type of bipartisan gun reform, but it seems like everybody has like big asks that the other side is unwilling to listen to. So. Um, I don't know, the gun, the gun reform stuff for me, because Democrats tend to focus on things like rifles, um, and then Republicans... Which is stupid. Yeah, and then Republicans yeah. don't really want to do anything, um, which I think is also stupid. Um, I, I feel like closing the private loops, the private seller loophole, I think is good. I think everybody should be required to fill out the federal background check, I think is fine. Um, and then there are some like red flag, flag laws that I think are like, okay, but as far as I'm aware, like neither of those things really made it into any of the Biden gun control legislation. So I don't know, I don't really have any strength. Would you be, there. like for example, when, when Trump did the bump stock ban or whatever, do you think, uh, you know, because basically they, they just gave that to them with no concessions whatsoever. Do you think it would have been a reasonable, like it could have been more bipartisan if they gave like, you know, Republicans national concealed carry reciprocity and then gave them the bump stock ban? Um, maybe, but if you're is that something you would be a fan of? Well, I mean, if your own Republican president is gonna <laughs> is gonna do gun control, I mean, why would you give anything if he wants to give it to you for free? You know, I, I agree. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that everybody's so freaked out by the because that came off the heel of the Vegas shooting, right? Mm -hmm. Where people were like, yeah, fucking ban it. So, um, yeah, I, I think that there are, um, like I said, I think closing the private sale is good. Um, closing that loophole. I would say like, don't be so strict on things like silencers and stuff. It's really silly, like how crazy the federal government is. Um, I know that a lot of state governments, and I think, are starting to get challenged. Like, I think New York had their basically like their pistol ban kind of like thrown out, right? Well, um, they had a they had a carry ban thrown out. They basically had their 
uh, May issue regime policy that dealt with uh, good cause thrown mm -hmm. out. That was under the New York State Rifle Pistol Association v. Bruin case, um, which is now pretty much rolling back like every pre-existing gun control law throughout the country. A lot of states are which having Because yeah. uh, they changed the standard now. It's now like a lot of lower courts were doing undue burden standards, but now uh, the standard they're going with is uh, it's basically text, history, tradition, mm -hmm. uh, which is what Clarence Thomas put out, and because uh, you know he wrote the decision, and that's like the strictest. It's even crazier than like strict scrutiny. It's, it like goes beyond that, and like <laughs> these uh, localities and states are having a hard time actually justifying any of their laws because they can't find a, uh, a an eighteenth century like you know time frame justification because that's basically what they have to go back to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. James, what else you <laughs> anything? James? Yeah, in addition to me, if anyone else has any sort of conversation fodder, in, in particular, can be specific questions, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I do have one from online. Those questions are? Yep, absolutely. And then if you guys can repeat the question, I'd actually be uh, Yeah, I have a question for nuance, bro. Uh, you describe the Inflation Reduction Act's uh, uh, deficit reduction as practically a wash, and really doing it, practically nothing. Um, the Congressional Budget Office looked at the Inflation Reduction Act, and they found that it reduces the inflation Billion, that was back. the. So I'm curious, like, who's wrong here? No, you're actually right. I think initially it was 90 billion, but I think in the final revised version it was 238 billion. For so, thank you for reminding me. But again, that's over 10 years. So if we look at the deficit currently, it's over a trillion dollars. So basically, over 10 years, that, that would be like 23 billion, 24 billion dollars a year. So basically, in the grand scheme of things, in the wider deficit, it's basically nothing. I mean, what's 23 billion out of, uh, what, what is that, out of a trillion? Is that 2, 2.3, 2.3, 2.3%? 2 yeah, so it's really not much at all. It's basically nothing. Is no, it's not 20%. Over 10 years it is. The, the deficit on an annual basis is over a trillion dollars. So 20, 20, 23 billion, no, wait. 23 billion annually, that would be 2.3 percent. That's not that. So you, you can't you can't take the 10 year number for one and then push it into the one year number for another. Any other questions? I got a question. Oh boy. Right, so you guys are talking about spending cuts for like 10 years out and all that, but we all know that no Congress can bind a future Congress. So if you backload all the spending cuts, won't this just be another? Yeah. They're spending all the money now. I feel like we have uh, a really. You want to restate the question? Oh people. yeah, sorry. Yes. Um, so the question was like, um, you can't really bind Congress to future budget cuts. They could theoretically like roll back on it later if they're negotiating some other piece of legislation or whatever. Um, I mean, that can always happen, but I, I mean, that's just kind of the reality of our democratic system. Um, it seems weird that presidents can kind of push stuff off into like future administrations and then hope to see how they deal with it. Um, like, arguably, you could argue. Um, Arguably, you could argue that the Afghanistan situation was kind of like that, where Trump had like pushed off that leave date until like after he was either out of office or in office a second time. And there's a lot of weird games you can play there, where it's like, well, if I get back, I can change it later. If I don't get back, then whoever's there is kind of fucked. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what the um, I don't know what the the counteract like how you deal with stuff like that in, in our democratic system. I'm not sure, especially as we become like more willing to fight over every single fucking thing, um, whether it's like a defense of marriage act or whether it's like against like the raising the debt ceiling or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know what the answer yeah. to that is. I mean, budgets are almost always passed. Like everything budget wise is passed on like a 10 year time schedule. Uh, I think that's good in the sense of, you know, stability, giving people a sense of like, OK, this is what budgets are going to be like, I think doing everything year to year um, it leads to a lot of problems. But uh, I, I, I agree. I mean, we've, we've seen this before with like the sequester situation uh, where they're like, OK, well, let's cut this and then we'll give you know, more for the military and this and that. Um, uh, so they, <laughs> it, it's just that's the nature of Congress. Like, what are you going to do? Yeah, sure. I guess. That's the nature of Congress. <laughs> Dumbass. Yeah. I 
<laughs> so basically his question is under Trump, 2 million people lost uh, ACA coverage, whereas under Biden, I guess 14 million gained it. So why is it good to be uninsured? I, you know, a bit of a biased question. Uh, I'm not as familiar with some of the ACA stuff that um, Trump and the Biden, like all, all that stuff. Um, I'm, I'm not as familiar. Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm not as familiar, to be honest. So. <laughs> So, like, every president has a different set of, like, circumstances when they come into office, like uh, coronavirus, inflation, or even going further back. What are some metrics that you can kind of take, like, absent those uh, environmental factors, if any, that you can kind of judge, like, a president like Biden versus Trump versus Obama versus Bush? Like, what are some of those metrics that you can kind of just take out of this? So the question was, um, presidents inherit situations. How can you really tell, you know, what metrics would you use to determine how an individual president is doing absent the circumstances that they found themselves in, whether it's inheriting a good economy, bad economy, war situation? Um, it's, it's, it's a tough one. I mean, most Americans, I, I think, they just kind of look at the circumstances around them and say, oh, well, things bad. This person's president. Therefore, this person responsible for bad situation. Um, I, I, I guess you could... You can maybe try to look at similarly situated um, countries and see how they're handling things. So if they started out in a relatively similar position and, you know, how did their leader, how did their country handle something? Did they do better? Did they do worse? How did we respond? Um, I, I think that's, that's, that's one way to look at it. Um, you can even look on like a state by state level to see like what kind of policies and maybe similar environments uh, affected things differently. Um, you know, I, you could put, I guess, you know, like DeSantis in Florida versus, I don't know, Whitmer in Michigan and see how those things, not, not to say like those states are completely analogous or whatever, but just, you know, governing styles um, during similar periods of time, general philosophies of, of you know, thinking and operating. Um, so I guess those are some answers on that. I feel like we can kind of look at like, or how do you, so when I look at how each president dealt with the coronavirus stuff, it felt like Biden was pretty aggressive and that like in his first 100 days, I think his goal was like what, like 100 million shots and he'd gotten like 200 million. I think in his first 100 days in office, um, I think he used the Defense Production Act in order to assist companies with creating like personal protective equipment. Um, I feel like when it came to dealing with issues like that, Biden moved about as aggressive as he could. I could compare that to Trump being on TV saying like, we only have six cases here, it's fine. It's only 13 cases, it's fine. It's only 27 cases. Like we have like a whole history of him basically like gaslighting all of us saying that there aren't that many infected people. And it seemed like the getting like personal protective equipment and stuff, that rollout was really, really slow under him. Maybe because he was like unwilling to take it as seriously as it was. I mean, so, I mean, if you want to talk metrics wise, you know, the first, you know, basically Trump's last year in office, there was no vaccine effectively. It was in trials, but it was not uh, out there for the general public. Yet you had more, in, you know, basically the year that Trump was in office, granted there was like a month where there wasn't really, it, it was kind of there-ish, it was there, but we just didn't fully know about it. But um, basically there were more deaths under the first year of Biden, um, even with the vaccine and the vaccine rollout and a lot of people being vaccinated than there was uh, under Trump and nobody being vaccinated. So, I mean, if you want well, to like, look at Well, like, why do we think those, that was? Because um, it hadn't spread as much yet, right? Well, there, there, <laughs> there, there's that, but there's also, you know, the vaccines probably weren't as uh, effective as we were told. For example, we were told, oh, it's going to stop the spread, it, it stops transmission, and then we get Pfizer coming out and saying, oh, we actually never really, uh, that, that wasn't part of, a, we never claimed that, that wasn't part of our well, when, testing. Well, so, yeah, actually. I mean, when you trial a vaccine, it's not, I, I don't even know if you can trial to stop the spread, because you have to vaccinate, like, entire communities to do it. But that was that's, what everyone was telling us. I that's don't what believe the, that's what everyone was saying. Why, are you serious? That, nobody was saying that it was going to 100% stop no, the spread. No, no, not 100%. There's, they were claiming uh, the, the, the efficacy was super high. It's like, once you get this, it stops with you. If you get the vaccine, yeah, there it doesn't are, like, transmit to other, you don't get yeah. other people sick. There are, Rachel Maddow was saying this. President Biden was saying this on the campaign trail. Yeah, there were a couple quotes from, like, Biden and 
Fauci. One is from Biden where it's like, if you get, if you get vaccinated, you're not gonna spread it or whatever. Like, yeah, I think they said a couple things like this, which were like kind of dumb, but like taking into context what they're saying, there, there was no- like, That's why realistic. a lot of people got the vaccine. It was not there like, was they, no they were hearing that all over the place. At some point, we have to stop treating Republicans like actual children, okay? If you listen What's to- What's that the have to do with If you listen to the totality of what was said, there was no reasonable expectation given that the vaccine was gonna 100% stop the transmission. No one's, no, no, unless I'm, you're I'm not saying 100%. Unless, okay, when well, you're not saying, saying that they were saying 100%. Even if you want to take the 95% efficacy the 95%, or whatever. The efficacy is high for preventing you from getting infected, right? But like that doesn't mean well, that- Well, that wasn't even up. necessarily true either. The, but it, it was true. That's why the places that got more no, vaccinated- No, it's like an asympto- asymptomatic infection. Sure, you can have an asymptomatic infection, but the people that got vaccinated, when you look state to state, community to community, the communities that got vaccinated had lower mortality rates, lower hospitalization rates. They outperformed the unvaccinated communities in every single metric. Like, it's possible to play like the game, like the Alex Jones or Joe Rogan game, where you like clip like one statement of like, Biden said, if you get it, it stops the spread. Therefore, the entire establishment was saying, if you all got vaccinated, it's 100% effective, blah, blah, blah. I mean, if you want to play that game, you can. Such <laughs> this is what was being stupid. claimed, though, it, all over the media. It this wasn't was, all over the, it was all it was over the Republic. Absolutely. It was all over the conservative was media that was the media. spamming the same two clips of them saying it was going to happen. This is absolutely the case. What okay. are you talking about? You said Fauci yourself said it. Biden said they, it. They'll make like Rachel one, Maddow like you can cut it. out like five seconds of a statement of like an entire speech. And it's like, if you listen to what they're saying, it's very obvious what they're saying, right? right? Nobody is saying well, that it's going to be 100% I, I think I think what like, most of us remember, I, I remember, I think most of yeah, us understand. This was one of the clips. major claims about the Because you the saw vaccine. the same two clips played over and Everybody over again was saying Joe Rogan this. Did you ever claim this, by the way? On that it your, would 100% No, not one. Why do you keep doing the 100%? That's such a... That's such well, wait, a, what's the claim? That it would reduce the transmission? That, that, that it was, that it was like, it would reduce transmission it or whatever. It would reduce transmission. Well, that's not... It it was, they, didn't, they didn't study that, apparently. You can't... How could you study that for a vaccine? What do you mean, how would you study that? How could you study for a vaccine on a population if the transmission of a virus is reducing? How could you possibly do that without injecting an entire vaccine? Well, so then why, you, why would that be part of the claims? Because if you're less likely to get sick... If you watched all of the Biden or Fauci speeches, you would know this. No, but we, 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 was, we learned from the virus sick. a lot of the spread was asymptomatic infection. We sure, know it, plenty of people got infected from vaccinated it, individuals. It can be asymptomatic, but if you're less likely to get infected, you're less if you, likely If to you're saying you disease. can't study it, then you don't actually know. This but is we like can go look right? retrospectively at which communities had most of the virus, and it was the unvaccinated ones. So then you can make a claim about spread, yes or no? Retrospectively, yes. So, are, are the vaccine manufacturers claiming that? Are they saying? I don't know if they certain... made. I know prospectively because they said they never studied it. Pro, because you, do you understand the difference between saying you can't make the statement now, or, or you could make the statement in the past, but you could make? So the they statement still now. haven't studied, or they have now? And I don't know rap, if it's in the purview back. of a vaccine manufacturer to do epidemiological studies on the transmission of a virus. Of course it is. What are you talking about? The point of a vaccine is to try to prevent you from getting infected, or to try to reduce the symptoms if you. That's are That's the point of the vaccine. It's never to stop spread whatsoever. That's a byproduct. That of has nothing to do infection. with uh, like the, the measles uh, vaccine. Never, none of that was ever like oh herd immunity and like spreading to people. Herd immunity are things that you can do, but if you're a vaccine manufacturer and you're trying to get your vaccine passed through FDA trials, my understanding is all you have to do is show efficacy that the vaccine is safe, that it doesn't cause like a bunch of unwanted harm. I'm not talking about effects. FDA and approval to- for a vaccine. I'm talking about like the, the purpose of a vaccine is never to reduce spread. It, that's a byproduct of reducing the amount of infection. Then, then why didn't they make a? So you, you, you're speaking out of both sides of your mouth. I'm saying, not speaking out of my mouth. It's very, very, very clear. You're, you're the saying, goal is here's you're the saying goal. they didn't make a claim about transmission, but that it's also a by that if it's a byproduct, they they can't like say like how much of a byproduct it is. Of, no, because how could you possibly know? That? Well, then how can you make the claim whatsoever if you can't attach any figure to it? I don't at, think at all. the pharmaceutical companies weren't making the claim that it's going to stop. The claim was that it's a safe vaccine that will reduce the likelihood of you getting infected. A byproduct of that is most likely going to be a reduction. Yeah. Transmission, but you can't know we'll, that uh, we'll as a vaccine to, uh, manufacturer because, like you said, an asymptomatic spreader could theoretically. I'm not. I'm not. A de- I'm not a designer of studies. I'm pretty sure there's probably a way that you can measure like once everybody's trans- vaccinated. Yeah, but not in phase three trials. Like, oh, like we vaccinated once everybody's. You, once you have like that. Studying transmission is going to be a societal wide effect, right? Let's say that I go to a community and I vaccine, you know, like one percent of the community. How can I study the spread? Not everybody's How vaccinated. There's no way that you could even like. I mean, we, we contact tracing. Yeah, but like the the like. For instance, what if like one person in a household? Gets Isn't that how we measured? Like we 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 figured out spread based on contact tracing for unvaccinated people. You can't do that for vaccinated people. You can figure out what the spread is, but after only vaccinating a few people, try to figure out what the spread will be. 
like the, um, what do you call it, like wide tails, like the data on that would be insane. Like I would be, if you're telling me that you vaccinated, even if you got like 10,000 people in a state vaccinated. What do you spread will be? Well, if, let me finish. If you vaccinated 10,000 people in a state and then afterwards you're going to tell me based on those 10,000 that you can predict like what the transmission is going to be. Well, what, like not everybody in those communities is vaccinated. You don't know what kind of people they're coming in contact with necessarily. Like I don't, I don't think that, I don't have vaccine manufacturers ever like said as part of their trial, like, oh, and also it's going to reduce the transmission by 45%. I don't think that's in the purview of a vaccine manufacturer. That can only be studied retrospectively after, like, society-wide, you've had a vaccine program. Okay. Well, questions? Yeah, it's a general question for the two of you. Um, when, so roughly one in 320 Americans have died as a result of coronavirus. Um, now, we had uh, this, this whole episode of people who promoted things like hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, who dissuaded people from getting the vaccine and dissuaded people from wearing masks. I'm wondering, would you consider there, that the people who did this, um, who were predominantly Republican, would you consider them to be any responsible for these the, the scores of dead uh, from the coronavirus? Do you, do you think a public pressure campaign might have contributed to the deaths? Okay, so the question is, do you think uh, people who promoted, well, basically counter-signaled the vaccine, and promoted, uh, you know, what would, what they view as alternative treatments that aren't necessarily scientifically proven, like hydroxychloroquine or uh, uh, ivermectin. Are did did, did that did that public discourse contribute, or how, are they responsible? Um, I mean, I, I I I suppose like did it contribute? Probably, yeah. But, but I mean, at the same time, like you have to look at the other side of this as well, like the people who advocated policies that weren't proven uh, when it comes to, you know, stopping spread or uh, making things where, like, for example, like stopping kids from going to, to school for so long. I, I think most people now looking back would agree that they did that for way too long. Uh, children were not really at risk at this virus, statistically speaking, it, like it just did not justify the actions that were taken. Um, lockdowns in general, I mean, you got the John Hopkins study that says like it probably like net maybe reduced deaths by like, it was something like 0.1%. It was crazy, but like they basically said lockdowns had no effect and it wasn't worth it, uh, especially looking at the other negative downstream effects that we've been seeing. I mean, like learning loss, economic uh, issues and things like that. We can also look at some of the countries uh, that promoted policies of you know staying more open. Everybody talks about like Sweden or whatever. If you compare it to its Nordic neighbors, they experienced more deaths. Um, they arguably front loaded a lot more of those deaths um, uh, initially, but you know they had lower outcomes than a lot of other countries, and including the the United States. I'm pretty sure when it came to uh, death rate, not earlier on, but now. Uh, so I, I think there was a lot of mistakes made. Um, by a lot of people, but I think the most egregious mistakes were the people that you know kept us locked down for so long. Uh, even the masking policy, which it wasn't really uh, proven, especially the types of masks that were recommended initially. I mean, the CDC even came out and said cloth masks or the, the statistical significance on actual uh, affecting uh, spread or uh, like you know infection things like that is basically zero. So uh, a lot of people wearing that stuff for, for nothing. Just on two fronts. So one, <clears throat> Sweden did underperform every other country, every other Scandinavian country with their coronavirus Yeah, policy. so I said the Nordic countries. Yeah, and they, um, they also still experienced like a pretty like significant um, uh, output reduction that I think was comparable to other countries as well. So it's not even like um, they didn't like save their economy. I think a lot of people generally just stay home when they get sick and whatnot. So it seems like they had a lot of the negative experiences uh, economically and then suffer even more health wise because of their policy. I mean, they were open more. So I mean, that's always a nice thing if you enjoyed that. Um, but I don't know if I would cite that as being successful. I do think lockdowns are pretty effective. If for no other reason, we can compare Sweden to the other countries, we can compare other countries around the world. Um, and we can look at the studies that have been done in the United States, of which there have been multiple of them done. Uh, people like to quote that John Hopkins studies, but one, it wasn't a Johns Hopkins study. It was one of the professors that contributed to that study was a professor at Johns Hopkins, but they've had to actually remove that from the study because it's not a Johns Hopkins study. And two, the methodology in that study is insane. The way that they uh, measured 
the way that they actually measured lockdowns was if there was at least one non-pharmaceutical intervention done. So if your community had like mask mandates, they considered that a lockdown. Um, I, that, so that study came back saying that there was basically no effect, but it is the only study that has ever come out that said that lockdowns had no effect whatsoever on transmission, probably because the methodology of that study was so wacky. I mean, you could also look at states like uh, like Florida versus some of the states, uh, what New York and New Jersey. Don't do, the, don't do that. You're well, I th do that. I, I, oh, I, no, I can't. Come on. I, listen, I haven't New looked York, at the, the, the one of the most heavily dense places in the world, that was the first one to get massively. Yeah, impacted. but I mean, you could say similar things about Florida as far as having a much more elderly population and things like that. But they decided to take this approach of okay, let's uh, you know maybe quarantine out elderly people, protect them, but. The rest of the population, you can go out, your risk is very low, and then you're actually building up natural immunity as well, which a lot of people were downplaying initially, but a lot of other countries take a lot more seriously. If you got recently infected, for example, a lot of other countries will actually list that on your you know, vaccine passport or whatever version of that that they have there and say, hey, this counts, but in America, we don't give a shit about that apparently, even though Fauci says it's actually valid, but we still haven't done anything about that. And then even after you're infected, it's like, well, then you still have to get like a booster or get COVID vaccinated uh, in a lot of places to go, you know, visit restaurants. Not, not as much now, but, you know, initially in the past and stuff, um, even to get into the country for a lot of people. There were, they, they still in America uh, for foreigners have vaccine mandates, even though most other countries have basically uh, they still, wait, have got, vaccine mandates for foreigners. Wait, what do you mean to come into the country in the United States? You have to show that you're vaccinated. I don't know if that's true. I can't. Yeah, that. it might be. But um, yeah, I will say that like that. when people, okay, everybody always does this when they say, how well did the mandates work? And then the first thing that comes out of them is New York. Like I can't wait to say New York because it was <laughs> the first place where everybody traveled to that was fucking sick where everything started spreading and like the initial numbers like, oh, it must be only 100 people infected when it was probably in the tens of thousands, if not more, right? If you want to compare New York to another state, why not just compare New York to New York? and see like, well, what did the infections look like? They looked like this. And then as soon as they started doing really aggressive lockdown measures, they looked like this. But dude, it looks and, like, like that seen... everywhere, regardless of measures. It, it always go spikes and then comes down. That's when that's you do the measures, yeah. No, no, when you don't do even anything. That's always... not true when you don't do anything. What goes like up Australia. comes down. Like no, it happens like that everywhere. But like, but... <laughs> it happened like that in Sweden too. Like it happens like that everywhere. Yeah, but it's, the, it doesn't the... just go like, 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 like this, the, the rate, it goes up and then it comes down. The, there is you don't think, very... like, again, you don't believe in natural immunity that doesn't do anything of course it does something okay so of course like after you get a certain amount of like people is, especially like a, super spreader hyper spreader types smooth, what do they call it smooth it comes down right smooth the hump smooth the hump what do they say uh lower the curve whatever the fuck there was a name for flatten it. the curve flatten the curve smooth well that the was hump. for like okay. hospital that was not to like overwhelm hospitals yeah, but stuff. that's the yeah. whole point right so yeah. lockdown measures well are sweden effective. didn't overwhelm hospitals but no but they had a lot more people dying <laughs> I, I mean, like, well, not, look, not compared to, to America in a lot of not states. To America, not a lot of states I mean, that took measures. A lot of no this offense, has to do with different populations. Sweden has like a population of like LA, okay? There's like 9 million people million, that yeah, live yeah. In, in Sweden, yeah. okay? So yeah, and nobody's traveling to Sweden, okay? Um, a lot of people were traveling. Are you kidding me? As me they were one of the only countries open in Europe. A lot of people were. Andrew Tate, you, you, you were traveling yes, there. You were friend, traveling there during all this stuff. How much, how much travel do you think the entire country of Sweden gets compared to New York City? Uh, during coronavirus? Sure, during coronavirus. Uh, I'd imagine Sweden. Sweden probably got more people during the that Than New time. York City? It's, yeah. It's I'd, one of the dude, biggest Did you cities? look at the streets of New York? They were dead. They were empty for like a decent sure, chunk of the, time. The, that was not the case The lockdowns in New York didn't happen until after the virus is already there. Like you can look at. Oh, I'm not talking. Yeah, we're, we're not talking before all like this. But the that, stuff. but that's the frustrating part is because whenever you throw New York in people's faces, you are bringing up before because all of the spread had happened before anybody even knew what the fuck was going on. That's when Trump was on Twitter and on on the on the, in the press saying like, oh, we only have like 16 confirmed cases, we're fine. When tens of thousands of people were probably getting affected in New York, and then afterwards we we um, you know when when shit finally starts going down, we're like, oh well, let's see who's doing good. <laughs> well, New York, you know, they fucking suck. That's a blue state. Looks like lockdowns didn't work. When as soon as they started implementing the, the numbers plummeted and not because of natural immunity, not because they would have any. So here's a question. Do you think that when you see how aggressively some places, we say Australia, we say New York, started doing lockdowns and you saw the numbers come down, do you think they would have went down in any comparable way if they would have done nothing? Uh, I mean, you saw that in uh, some, you know, you saw that basically in Sweden. They had a spike too, and it came down. So you think that it would have basically taken the same trajectory? With uh, it, no, it probably, the spike probably would have come, I mean, it, it probably would have been prolonged by a bit longer, but probably not anything. Okay, crazy. I submit that it would have been significantly worse without the aggressive lockdown yeah, measures. Well, but 
I guess we'll weird, never weird. know. You know? We'll so never I mean, know. look at other countries that did significant lockdowns like Australia and New Zealand and had very little, if any, uh, issues with the coronavirus. But Well, they had a lot of issues with the, the policy associated they had issues with, with the policy, it. But they didn't have people I dying. mean, putting people in concentration camps basically over there. I, I heard that. It was yeah. concentration camps literally. And, yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it, 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 listen, it's not the same as like Auschwitz, but it's still like, it's not. Like a kangaroo It's in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a free, in a, in a d- democracy, a free Western nation. Okay, but now we're not, shifting uh, the conversation. I agree. That's probably I, not I ideal. I agree yeah. that having freedom and being able to run around and stuff was cool, right? That was cool in Sweden, that every other place in the world, you felt like That's you That's why you, you went there, yeah, partially. Yeah, it was yeah. cool walking around the streets. <laughs> but you can't, this is like, it's the frustrating conversation. I like guns too, okay? I enjoy guns, I like shooting, but I recognize that by making them legal in the United States, some crazy motherfuckers out there are more likely to kill themselves just by having them in the home. Some people mm. are gonna have their kids kill themselves just because they find the firearm. And you know, some people are gonna get into violent issues using firearms just because they have them. Just having the firearm like predisposes you towards that. Like, if you wanna have the benefits of one thing, you have to be willing to acknowledge the downsides. I, I personally like the way that Sweden dealt with their stuff. I don't know if we could have handled it in our medical infrastructure the same in the United States, but I'm not gonna say that Sweden did it at no cost. And it seems like you're willing to recognize that, yeah, they, they, they had some cost compared to every other Scandinavian country, but they had more freedom too. But then if you look at places like Australia, they paid- Well, hold on. It seems like you agree that, like, again, you said you liked the model that, you know, happened there. Uh, it seems like you're, you, you might agree that the cost on the other side of doing, like, the extreme lockdowns and things like that is actually worse. That's why you prefer the model that they did. Yeah, it's possible, yeah. But I'm not, like, I think I- it's hard because I don't know. I did live in California, which had insane. You needed the passports and all the gyms shut down and everything was fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Um, what but, a great way to promote public health. Shut down the gyms and then give people Krispy Kreme donuts. Oh, yeah, because we know that in the United States, accident. people are visiting the gyms so fucking often. Okay, yeah, of course. I mean, um, in California, all, all I'm saying, all I'm saying it affected is that, people. All I'm saying is that, like, Maybe there could have been less aggressive lockdown measures taken in some areas. I probably been okay with that, but I'm not going to sit here and say lockdowns did nothing because they clearly were very effective in the places. Oh no, I, I, I would like never say they did them. nothing. They did a okay. lot of well, because when you quoted the Johns Hopkins study, you well, said no, they, they did they a did lot did. of terrible things. Okay, but, uh, all right, yeah. well. uh, let's go back there. The question so, was whether or not yeah. more people killed themselves because of lockdowns. I don't even know statistically if those numbers came out. I thought people were saying initially that they were worried about like mass suicides, but I don't know if that, I don't know if that ever was borne out. I thought that I thought the crime that went up more was, <laughs> that's not funny. I'm sorry. Was uh, domestic abuse because like people were locked in together so much. I thought that was like one that you saw increase a little bit, but I don't know if there was like a huge like epidemic. Of well, suicide. we had a lot of deaths of despair. I mean, deaths of despair have gone up significantly. I mean, we had over a hundred thousand people. I think. Uh, maybe even from fentanyl alone uh, when it comes to, to overdosing. Uh, you know, it's now the number one cause of death among people, uh, I believe, 18 yeah, to 45. Yeah, there's the weird age bracket of like from the ages of 18 to 45 where people aren't really supposed to be dying anyway. Um, the biggest contributor to their death is fentanyl. Yeah. Or yeah. I think it might be opiate related deaths, but sure. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's it's, it's, it's important. It's blamed on the lockdowns. <laughs> Like, what do you mean? Like, is it like, I, like I can't go to work? Like, I'm locked out of my apartment. I need fentanyl. Is that the? I'm just curious. Well, I mean, thing. when when people are losing their jobs all over the place and they can't see their loved ones and people, they, you know, like, yeah, that's gonna play. I think it's the, okay. you basically destroyed people's lives. I think it's uh, deaths of despair are gonna go up. Yeah. I feel like we've had like, especially like in places like the Midwest. I think we've had a problem with opiates in the country for a long time. Yeah, but it, it, it went up drastically, and it's not not just in the Midwest. In San Francisco, I mean, like, it, it just skyrocketed like an insane amount. Sure, but I don't, again, like, there, there have been different drugs that have been coming and going. Fentanyl has gotten really popular over the last several years. I don't know if I would blame it on the lockdowns. I feel like that's a hard sell, that, like, we're locked down, so now we're doing fentanyl. I, I mean, I guess it's possible, but maybe there'll be another Johns Hopkins study on that one. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, during COVID, the common flu completely disappeared. Uh, can you explain why that happened, and is there any other examples of common respiratory disease happening in the same way that we're just disappearing when another yeah, do you want to restate the question? Yeah, so the question was, um, why did the common flu disappear when, um, when the lockdowns happened? And I think, that the, uh, I think that the conservative talking point is that all the flus are just being reported as the coronavirus. Um, I think that the counter talking point is that when you have the most infectious virus in the history of 
humanity, which was COVID-19, when that virus happened and we started to take aggressive lockdown measures to curb the spread of that, other diseases that were less transmissible are going to see a massive reduction in transmission. I think that seems pretty reasonable to me, but. Yeah. I mean, another thing people don't talk about is we, we didn't take these measures with the common flu, right? And the idea was, well, this was a lot more deadly than the common flu. And that was true initially. If you look at the IFR, um, it was like way more, but like, I think as soon as it starts dipping around that number or even below, which we've seen that, like the COVID IFR is below uh, the common flu. And then people are still taking these insane measures, treating it like it's this insane thing that we have to like all worry about and be super scared of. It's, it's pretty ridiculous, but go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, this kind of goes to this idea of like mean orange man. He's like na nasty on Twitter. Uh, you know, he's he's divisive. Oh, so divisive. And then Biden's like this bumbling old fool. Oh, he's so nice. He's grandpa. He sniffs hair and you know all that stuff. Um, I, I don't. I, honestly, I don't even want people to like the president. I'd, I'd rather have people like hate the president and not look up to him. I've, I've always found it weird. Like people are like, honey, that's the president. Like you should look up to him. Like that's no, you, you shouldn't like uh, our leaders. Our leaders should be. They're, they're, they're gross people. I don't think we should ever admire them. To honestly, but whatever. The, real world implications is what I'm the, the character has real world implications. Absolutely. I mean, I think they're. I think just their actions and how they carry themselves. Not not so much like is he like mean on Twitter and stuff. Like so, so for example, when Trump's style of being more kind of like impulsive and bombastic and. You know, we're, we're going to, you know, hey, Mr. Rocket Man in North Korea. Listen, in, in that case, it kind of worked out, I guess. Uh, a little How bit. did it work out? I mean, we got zero <laughs> concessions from North Korea for so, anything. Like, we gave them photo opportunities wait, wait, with how our many, people. How Even ma Pence was, I think, how, a how many How many issue. missiles were, was North Korea launching into, like, South Korea's waters during that time? Launching into South Korea's waters? Because like, they're, right they they're doing they a bunch still, right now. They're doing a bunch right now under Biden. Happening, but but they didn't slow down any of their testing programs. They might not have been shooting missiles towards South Korea, but there wasn't a single concession that we pulled from uh, North Korea in all of those talks that happened. Uh, it was a lot more peaceful during that time. South Korea was a lot less worried. But, you know, they, they, again, missiles weren't being lost. All of Europe was literally so. saying we might not be able to look to the United States for leadership anymore. They can say all the <laughs> fucking shit they want. They were wrong about it. Trump was telling Germany, hey, uh, the German delegation at the UN, hey, uh, you're getting all your energy from Russia. Isn't this is uh, pretty bad? Like you're gonna have to, you know, deal yeah, Trump with this. Made a and they laughed. They laughed at him, and now that he's been proven right, you, basically, he hasn't like, been proven gonna... right on anything. Trump made a thousand ridiculous statements about all sorts of things. Yeah, like, but on that one, course, he was, he yeah, was well, you know, when that's you, all I'm saying. That's all I I'm can saying. make a thousand random statements to be correct on two, and I can say, well, history has proven me to be no, correct. No, for sure, broken clock like, and all those things. Yeah, but of I'm course, just saying like a, on that a, statement. A broken, Absolutely. You know, Germany's perfect. dealing with the, the ramifications of them deciding to rely on Russian energy this whole time. And now, you know, the, the, like, again, they're being stupid. They're shutting down nuclear plants. Now they're, you know, luckily extending them because, like, oh, we don't want to freeze to death and die. So that's uh, luckily they're heeding some of that uh, advice and being a little bit more level headed on that front. Do you really don't think the decorum of a president has any bearing whatsoever on how, like, no, of course it does. Of course it does. I think it matters. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, I thought you. It's okay. I'm sorry. I, it, that sounds like I, I just the exact think, opposite of what you just spent no, no, like I five think, minutes I, saying. I, 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 I think people exaggerate and like put too much emphasis on like, oh, I don't like the mean tweets. Like that's what a lot of like a lot of people who won't vote for Trump is honestly a lot of it. I'm not saying all of it. I'm not saying any of the people in this room. But there's a lot of people who I've heard them say, and they even it's reflected in the polling that they don't like. He's just a mean man, and he says not nice things. And I'm like, I think that's kind of stupid. How is that stupid? Part of the <laughs> goal of being the leader of a country is that you're supposed to be leading all sides like towards one common goal. When you're literally using your position. I mean, position, you, can, you can do that by being mean. No, not by. Absolutely. No. What was, you'll say. Listen. No, no, hold you, on. You no, can no, say no, all you'll you want about. This, Dick, I guarantee no, you. No, let me finish my point. Let me finish my point. You can take all these like nasty dictators throughout history who were mean and brutal, but I mean, were they not leading their people towards one common goal? I think you could say they were, 
But it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good one. I'm just, it's still a common goal, but I don't, you know, I'm just saying. I, in my opinion, your head of state should be your chief cheerleader. This is like the guy that people sees as being like resembling uh, or emblematic of like your country and your people and what you're voting for and what you're standing for. So when he's on Twitter, at fucking 4 a.m. in his underwear, tweeting some wild shit that he just heard from fucking Fox and Friends. I don't know. That to me is like really fucking sad. I think it, it was, reflects uh, poorly. It was on, pretty entertaining. It reflects poorly. Yeah, you can say yeah, this entertaining, but it yeah. reflects poorly on the character of our country. And if a Democrat were doing anything like that, like if Hillary Clinton had gotten elected and she was still saying like, "Oh, these basket of deplorables," people like you would be on Twitter, and be like, "Oh, she's so divisive. Oh, it's horrible that she calls Trump voters this." Like, we, I'm curious. Were you one of the people that were freaking the fuck out when that five second clip got cut from Biden's speech with, in, with the red background where he says like the MAGA Republican? Republicans, and you're like, this is horrible and divisive, and I can't it believe was, you said uh, this. It was not the best option. Exactly. So See, so, I, so it does matter when the Democrats do it, right? You'll take that one clip. Was that, was that a very uh, bringing together uh, it, speech? Yeah, uh, I think it was a fine Really? It, it wasn't divisive whatsoever? He literally explicitly calls out a segment of the Republican Party that's denying the election results. That's a, that's a large portion of the country. That's a big problem. You have to be able to say yeah, something but that's about that, it. That's also, but, he, uh, but, he'll, but he'll say explicitly like, in one of these speeches, he, he'll say, well, no, no, but he wasn't going out of his way to say, you know what, like, we're going to do things to actually make it so people can believe in our elections again. We're not doing that. What are we supposed to do every time? Uh, how about not have like half of the, uh, the, 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 the polling stations in Arizona the day of the election have uh, machine problems where it's actually lightly printing, where they had none of it during the early voting whatsoever. And uh, every, yeah, I, I think that's a bit sus. At, okay, so Biden needs to go down and personally tinker with each of the machines. Like, no, I mean, like, of course, the, you can you can pass policy and advocate that states pass policy to restore faith in the election. No, so you, you don't can't. have. No, you can't. No, you, you can't. can't. Because anytime people have gone to look for election fraud or look for voter fraud, they either find none or they find Republicans are you, doing oh, it. Are okay. You, are you really denying that there's been no history in America of election fraud or voter fraud? Of of illegal ballots cast? No. 1876? Are you serious? 1948. Uh, okay, I'm I didn't know we were going LBJ. back 150 okay, years. Fine. We'll, okay, we'll, we'll do, in, okay, my no, bad. No, 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 I, no, no. Hold on, I will we'll, take the L on that. In 1876, there might have been voter fraud that I didn't hear about. My <laughs> my mistake on that one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. We'll All do, I know no, is no, that no. when Trump, when no, no, Trump, no, no, you when, can keep when, filibustering. When Trump, Let's when, go more recent. Uh, LBJ in his primary in 1948. How much how much federal voter fraud was there? Federal voter fraud. Like in, in terms of his election, like in terms of like the presidential election. Are you saying there was no, enough to flip the election, or what is the? This he wasn't running for president in 48. This is for his Senate run. Okay, what is, your, what is your claim? He, he literally 202 fake ballots. This is like not disputed by anyone. Okay. This is like 100% fact. Sure, it might be. I'm he, sorry, I didn't know we were going 100 years He literally years back to stole find. the election with fake ballots, same handwriting, like alphabetical order, everything. And it was 200 votes for him and then two for his opponent of like these fake ballots. Um, why is it that every single part, Patterson, New Jersey, 2020, the judge every, even ruled that they had to redo that, that? Why is it that every single part of Trump's administration was pushing back on him when he was making these voter fraud claims? Wait, why, why are you denying the cases I just brought up to you? There might be some handful of cases. Okay, where so now it went from some, it never happened, this didn't exist to it might have happened, this might have what existed. What I'm saying, okay, the original claim that's been made by people repeatedly is there has never been voter fraud on a level that would have swayed any elections. It, okay? No, it absolutely did. There, though. Okay, in those the, cases, in the LBJ I literally one, asked it. Okay, maybe there was. Okay. I don't know about his Senate election. I don't know that one. In 1940, whatever, okay? I don't know about that one. Yeah. But I do know that Trump himself put together a panel of people to look for voter fraud in the United States, and he couldn't find any. I do know that as much as you're complaining about the machines, Barr and the FBI themselves got machines and looked at them, and they said, there's no problem. No, here. I'm not Nothing's talking about on. I'm talking about this. Uh, sure, I'm just saying that when like, you talk about like restoring faith in the elections, I don't think there's anything that you can do to, to, to help people that want to see what they want to see. I still hear people to this day talk about the, the ballot box that was mysteriously taken out from underneath the table from that YouTube no, video that, that played. Stupid. Um, yeah, it was stupid, that. but people Listen, still talk about it. But I'm saying, but I'm just saying that like, I don't think there is a set of measures you can do. Like you talk about like, oh, well, what about like some machines are having problems? I don't know. Like chances are today, anytime you hear about any I'm machine I'm talking about problems, real example. I'm not well, talking about bamboo fiber ballots with like, you know, shipped in from China. I'm not talking about people sending votes up into space. I make fun of those people. The, the Dominion machine people, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking okay. about real concrete examples where judges have even ruled in the Patterson, New Jersey case where they overturned and said you have to redo that and they've actually arrested, they're prosecuting the people right now, the Attorney General of New Jersey. 
Uh, when you know, they did that, re when they did that redo, was there a significant difference in the votes after redoing it? I don't, I don't even know if they. Isn't that kind it? of important know, to know? know? Isn't that a really important part of that? I don't know because I know they, they pushed for recounts in a lot of places. No, when they redo it, they're like, oh, it's about the same fucking number. I don't like, know if the redo has happened yet. They're still in the process of being criminally prosecuted as well. So, we'll we'll see the outcome of that case. This is, you know, New Jersey, not exactly a Republican bastion, by the way. Sure, I I just I don't think there's anything you could do to shore up the elections. I don't think anybody would be happy seeing anything at this point. Republicans wouldn't, not the people under Trump who still think that election was stolen, despite there being absolutely no evidence pointing that direction. I mean, but. you could go back to more uh, in-person voting, for example. I mean, because do, do you not think there's a lot more opportunity for fraud with mail-in ballots whatsoever? What, so what, do you get rid of mail-in ballots completely or what? No, you just, re you don't have mass mail-in ballots like a lot of states have been moving to, especially post-COVID. We used to, I mean, in my lifetime, over 95% of people would vote in person on election day in my lifetime. Like that was the norm typically. It's only in recent years where it's really dipped down below 50%. I feel like you have to show a problem to get rid of it. I like mail-in voting. I, that was I, I not, gave it you was examples. nice kind of thing. The Patterson New Jersey case, I believe, was actually done with uh, mail-in ballots. Sure, but we don't even know right now if the if the results were actually different. Mm. I don't know. I have to I, I don't remember if the result if they claimed the results would be different. I think they actually might have but Hi. Do you think that in the year of our Lord 2022, <laughs> most Republicans don't trust the elections because some machines in Arizona broke down and made it take a little bit longer for people to cast their votes? Do you think that's a compelling reason for so many Republicans to just reject the entire election integrity that, that we have? So I dis oh, so the question was, uh, do I think the reason people deny elections is because of basically what happened in Arizona, or is it because of, I guess, a lot of the other reasons that they're typically citing? Um, I disagree with a lot of the other reasons they're typically citing. Again, like I was saying, you up that one, though, that's why you, which one? What was that? You brought up that one, that's why you, that he said you brought up that one. That's why I used. No, I mean that's why I have some of the I have issues. I'm talking about me. Uh, there are a lot of Republicans who actually uh, agree with what I'm saying on, on those things, but some of them take it further with like the, the bamboo fiber ballots and some of the, like, who's the Kraken lady, you know, who's saying all the crazy Sydney stuff or, yeah, Sidney Powell. Uh, yeah, and, uh, that was it feel, I mean, it feels a little bit like what, like the BLM fallacy a little bit where like, if you ask, if you ask a lot of progressive people, how many unarmed black men do you think are shot and killed by the police every year? Their answer is going to be like 10,000, maybe 1,000, maybe 10,000, yeah. right? And the answer is like 17 or something, or, or like 30. Less. It's a very, 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 very low number. But like people will, peop, you, you can tell when you ask a person a question, like, okay, well, if you think that like 10,000 black unarmed men are being killed every year, that is, that's pretty insane. Like I can understand why you think that. But then when you go on the Republican side, like what is the expectation that no machine will break down in the entire country, that no delay will ever happen in the entire country, Dude, that no, like, like because, because 48% like, of the election day ballot places in Maricopa County having these issues where it was not present during early voting, uh, you know, anywhere else in the county, it wasn't present. It just happens to be on the day that Republican, and again, I disagree, Wait. I told, all, hold on, hold on, let me make my point. It didn't happen during early voting. It just happened to be on the day where people vote like 80-20 Republican. And again, I disagree with Republicans who kept telling me, oh, I'm going to wait till election day because that's how they can reduce the problem. I'm like, no, vote early. If it's available to you, vote early. Do whatever you got to do to do it. But don't wait till election day because if they're going to sabotage, they're going to do it on no, election okay, day. Hold and on I was still. proven right. Oh my that's God. exactly what happened. You were proven right. There was sabotage. Are, you think that was just happenstance? Forty-eight percent on election day, zero problems during early first voting all, in Maricopa so County. Here's what I'm going to do. Come on, Here, dude. first of all. So Come after, the, on, after this conversation, I'm going to Google forty-eight percent voting machine in Maricopa County, and I'm probably going to find that it's of not the election that day. I'm probably going to find sense. that it wasn't that number. No, I'm probably going to find that, was. that in one place they ran out of paper and that got tallied into that. It wasn't number running one. out of paper. Okay. It was number light. Two. It was light printing ink that then couldn't be read sure. by the number two. By the tabulator. Even if what you're saying is true. Wouldn't it make more sense for it to happen on election day than during early voting? Where in early no, voting, you've got people no. that are staggering in when you don't have as many people coming. They Wouldn't had it make more, sense that on a day on. when everybody's there no, 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 no. in a huge fucking line and they have like- No, it happened at the beginning of the day. It was right from the beginning, dude. Okay. It wasn't and, and, and later are, on. And then you are alleging that there was some sort of sabotage that happened. And 48% of Maricopa County's- just, I don't I'm clear. sure it's there's just a giant of, coincidence. Okay. It just happened on the so ones that were open on election day. there's some sort of conspiracy with the Democrats to destroy all of these- No, I'm sure Katie Hobbs, the person- 
person who's in charge of running the elections who just happened to be running for governor at the same time and narrowly won over uh, Carrie Lake. I'm sure that was just all yep. a giant And I'm sure Dinesh D'Souza is going to have a documentary watching her running I don't, from I don't every like, place, no, 2000, rigging, the ink, rigging two, the ink machines. 2000 like, Mules was horse shit. I was criticizing it right from the beginning. I don't like the D'Souza the docs, so that's okay. not me. Uh, back there. Have any, either of you read that Anne Kern County forensic audit of the Dominion machines? It's the Smiths of the Dominion machine thing, but have you read the forensic audit of the machine? That was in. This is some court. case to the questions about some county I've never heard of and the forensic That's audit. Fault, then, right? Yeah, I, got, I mean, do, do you know about this particular um, what, Is one? this the one that was done by the company that doesn't exist anymore? No. Uh, then. You're talking, uh, about the, you're talking about the Maricopa County audit. Yeah, I, I, that's you're what I was thinking of, yeah. Okay, um, no, I'm not, why don't you inform us, tell us. Look into it, they did an audit of the Dominion team and said that it was switching votes, like it's a forensic audit, you can read the report. But you go and dismiss it. it I'm not dismissing it, I just haven't heard it. I've, I've heard of the Maricopa yeah, County I'm not audit one, but I haven't heard Whenever it. Whenever I've looked into a lot of the Dominion machine claims, they just don't add they up. Haven't from, I, I feel like if there was a report that said I, that the I've machine seen, was actually like, switching I've votes, I've seen the I feel switching like, vote claim. They call it like black magic or something. I don't. Whenever I've looked into it, it just hasn't been. The, here's the thing with the Dominion machines. Typically, the, my understanding is most of them have paper backups. So when they print it out, you see. Are you talking about the machine itself on the printout is no, switching the vote, or it's no. in the tabulation it's system? Very, it, it sends more to What? Like they, they lie about what it says. You just gotta read the report. I don't know what that means. You gotta read the report. Dude. Education? <laughs> you gotta read the report. Well, I think uh, he's making it sound like they misstate what's actually on the ballot on the machine. Yeah. Well, here's the, the, here's the thing. Like, you could, oh, that's why I'm a big fan of paper backup systems. So when, you know, I, I like the machine. It's very convenient. You pick it out on the machine. It does the printout. You put it in the tabulation system. It's paper backup. So then if there is an issue with the count, you can do an actual hand recount. And then you have the paper system there. So I think paper backup systems. Are sure, but his issue specifically was that the machine was misstating, I guess, what was on the actual ballot. Oh, I'm saying, well, that's what you're claiming right, the report said. Right, Jesus right. Christ. Well, that's why, you can, <laughs> that's why you can look at the ballot and see if it chose right for you. I haven't heard it. I haven't heard of this at all. Yeah. Let's go to Sean. Sean. Yeah, the Republican, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Wow. And they find out that this guy was a consultant who had like worked for both parties for years with this innovative strategy <clears throat> of gathering these absentee ballots. So what was the uh, what was the name of the election or what, who was it? Who versus who? It was a Republican guy. It was a Republican for this race. It was a Republican who hired this guy. Yeah, but I'm saying was this a state election like for? It was the North Carolina. I believe it was a congressional race. For the congressional race? Okay, I'll yeah. check it out after. And they did have to redo it. So like, if, yeah. do you think that that makes it more vulnerable? I mean, yeah. listen, this is this is. Decently well known among people who actually conduct elections like you know people talk about ballot harvesting all the time right ballot harvesting I think is an issue for example it's illegal in the state of Arizona but you go to next door to California they allow it it's just like a free-for-all you actually have like you know I know of, of Republicans who now do ballot harvesting in uh, you know different congressional districts in California and you're like whoa how did this Republican win in that county like Fresno or this one over here like CD 13 it's because they're doing ballot harvesting is that democracy do you think that's like a, a good way to conduct a democracy is ballot harvesting like, when you say ballot harvesting are you just referring to collecting ballots that people have already you're literally out going and... out door to door saying oh did you get your mail-in because you know all these people are getting mail-in ballots because we have a, they have a mass mail-in ballot system now and it's literally like whoever can get to the door door first, tell this, you know, old person who doesn't even give a shit about elections to fill out the ballot and give it to you. It's, it's basically whoever does that first. Is that democracy? I don't, I don't I mean, think is, it is. I mean, if you want to start having questions about that, there's a lot of, like, we don't have, like, for instance, a day off for an election, right? Is that democracy that working class people So how about, do, like, I mean, like, there's a lot of you, questions you can hold get Hold on, to would you like, agree to a compromise where you basically eliminate most ma mass mailings? <laughs> Um, and then even reduce or even eliminate early voting, but then have a national uh, in-person election day like holiday so people could go vote? If people is that, actually, is that a compromise if, you if would agree to? If people wanted to do that, sure. 
But the problem is that the election claims never come from a place of good faith when it comes to conservatives. For instance, if somebody, people talk about like voter ID to vote, voter ID to vote. That's not even that rare. I'm pretty sure across most of Europe you need an ID to vote, but nobody ever pairs this with like a free national ID. If somebody's like, oh, if the federal government provides you with a free identification card, then fine, you can have an ID to vote. That's fine. And like, I, I believe, but nobody in, ever, I but believe it feels in most like, of the states that, ha or almost all of the states that have strict voter ID, they actually have a free ID uh, that's available to people who request it. That might, I don't pretty know sure if that's, that's true, because sure I always hear people say, oh, you have to I'm do is go to the sure DMV and spend true. 30 bucks and blah, 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 blah. But like, this would have to be like an idea, because the goal is, is whatever, the, the, if you are a person that likes democracy, which I'm not really sure how much of our country even cares anymore, but if you are a person that likes democracy, then the goal should be to put as many, as few roadblocks as possible between you and actually voting, while still maintaining the safety and integrity of our elections. So the biggest reason why I've always been critical of Republicans that are trying to say like, get rid of early voting and get rid of mail and blah, 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 is that generally speaking, for a country with over 100 million people voting, um, you don't usually see that many problems. Like, yeah, sometimes a machine breaks down or a pipe bursts or there's a the, box or whatever. It just seems to be in the but, contentious races like it happened in Harris County, which is now being investigated by the left-wing Soros uh, DA, who's actually saying the okay. there was, this probably happened. And the, uh, the the attorney general. Uh, sure, it's well, just not strange the, that people. The, that, the governor is 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 requesting a, an investigation. Okay. By I mean, the like historically, mail-in ballots, ballots have favored conservatives slightly because I think people from rural communities are more likely to mail-in ballots. It's and definitely stuff. not the case now. Uh, it might not be the case now, but I'm saying there were, there were, there were the no problems now. with them before when it favored Republicans. It wasn't mass <laughs> mail-ins. So just when the just when it was the Republican side that was tending to mail-in, you, you like, couldn't do like mass ballot harvesting back then because it didn't go out to like everybody. It's it's a lot more like of a problem now, absolutely. Okay. Um, Is there anyone who has to ask a question, guys? I got a question. He's got front row, James. One. Right here, James. 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 He's got one right front here. Front row. We'll go to okay. the front row and then back. Okay. Uh, yeah, for Nuance Pro, um, sorry to change the subject, but regarding the Biden administration, could you name me, uh, without them betraying your agenda or um, your overall ideology, could you name me a couple of specific What, what Biden could, so the question is, what could Biden do to give me a net positive impression? Yeah, without them betraying their political Oh, without, without them betraying yeah. their... Uh... Something like, for example, bipartisan. Oh, man. Because when you say net positive, like this, this means it would have to outweigh all the other negative things that I think are associated with the thing. I mean, they could, they could how, about, how about this? They could, there's things that they could do, I think, to not theoretically betray... <laughs> their values that I could support. Is that, is, is, could I answer so that? Like after the Biden administration is over, um, whenever that is, right? Um, you look Six more years, years, baby, sorry. You will travel and say, um, well, you know what, they may have been on the other side of the aisle, but overall, I think they did a pretty good job. With oh man, I think it'd be pretty tough for it to be overall without them betraying some of their, you know, principles and things oh. like that. But um, on like an individual issue, I mean, theoretically, if they, support this idea of democracy and you know voter integrity um if they wanted to come together with republicans to pass something like that uh, i would support it but i don't think they actually i don't think they actually want to do that so so like a, a quick follow-up if you don't mind really quick um yeah so are you, are you saying that then you're too ideologically opposed or whatever uh, for you to really have a good impression of that presidency realistically uh, it's not an, I mean, is it ideal? I mean, it, to some degree, almost everything yeah, we believe is like somewhat ideological, but like, it, it, to me, it's just, is it good policy? Is it bad policy? To me. So, I mean, is that what driven about, by ideology? I, 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 I guess, but I, I mean, I like to think I'm a pretty practical person. What about the things that Biden succeeded on that Trump said he was going to, but didn't? The fact that Biden got the infrastructure bill passed in one year when Trump couldn't do it in four, or that Biden was able to secure $1.5 billion in smart security for the border wall from Mexico that Trump never could. Like, are those like benefits to Biden's administration or? So, well, if we want to talk about the border and, and Biden and that whole debacle. I mean, we're seeing record levels that we've never seen before of illegal immigration across our southern border. We're seeing- Do you notice how you didn't answer the question all Well, just, no, no, because it's <laughs> like, it didn't, it didn't do point. anything. It's like <laughs> Trump actually, re, like he actually re achieved results when it came to illegal immigration uh, across the s southwest border, but we're not, like it's just drastically, it's like 
it's horrible what's happening under Biden, and they're not doing anything. He puts Kamala Harris in charge of the border. She visited like one time and is like, has she actually done anything on that? Like, okay, so reiterating the question, the uh, fact that Biden was able to secure a one and a half billion dollar investment from Mexico into smart security on the border that Trump wasn't able to do, and the fact that Biden was able to pass an infrastructure bill in one year with bipartisan support that Trump wasn't able to do in four, are those things you're like, oh, okay, I'll give Biden a little bit of props for that. At least he did something there. He's not. Oh, sorry. Sure, sure. Yeah. He's again. It's what, what he's been doing at the southwest border. Net has been counterproductive. Getting rid of the remain in Mexico policy only to you know first of all the judges smack that down and they allowed it. But then he, uh, now he's reinstituting that basically, but with Venezuelan migrants. So he's basically conceding that that was actually an effective policy under Trump. I mean, he got rid of a lot of the Trump pol policies like the 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 the, the three country agreement between Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, I believe. And, you know, the, the immigrants who are coming across the border, whenever you ask them, if you look at the reporting of Bill Malugin, Jorge Ventura, uh, Julio Rosas, like, they all have the impression, oh, the border's wide open. Biden wants us to come here. And, I mean, I, I can't fault them for, for actually believing that. So. So, that. so I haven't gotten my check from Soros this month, so I can speculate a little about, about you know, Democrats for change. <laughs> Consider this is supposed to be about has Biden been successful, and we talked a lot about a lack of confidence in the election. What would Biden need to do to be considered successful in restoring confidence in the U.S. election? Uh, what would so Biden the, need so to do to restore confidence in the election for yeah, a nuance, that's, that's bro? the question. Yeah. Um, I mean, usually these things are handled at the state level, but I could see you know, if, if Biden, it was an issue he really cared about, like working with state leaders or even, you know, announcing publicly like, hey, th these are the types of measures we should take, like voter ID. I think that's a basic thing that actually the vast majority of Americans actually agree on when you look at the polling. Um, I think reducing mail-in ballots just because it, it is, ju it's just a way, there's so many opportunities for mail-in ballots to actually uh, just, you know, the person who's not actually you know the name attached to the ballot it could be someone else voting like you could never know um, whereas it's a lot harder to do that with in-person voting um, so basically reducing mail-in ballots as much as possible and uh, that, that's some pretty good stuff what's, what's, what's some other ones I'm trying to think it's, it's just not at the top of my mind as far as uh, the different types of policy but those are like two good ones I think to start with um, Uh, well, I mean, my answer is easy. I think that the incumbent advantage is huge. I don't think Biden should leave. I think Biden's really good during the midterms, and as long as his presidency continues to trend in this direction, I would say he's probably going to be okay. But obviously, anything can happen in two years, so who knows? But so, I mean, I would, I would obviously say Biden should run again. You wouldn't want to throw away that advantage. I'm conflicted because uh, here's the thing: I don't. There's a lot of unknowns with, uh, you know, the, the uh, like different candidates. So, for example, let's say you say Trump, right? Uh, you know, you look at some of his first term performance. I wasn't a big fan of a lot of things that were happening uh, under that, especially with some of his administration picks. Uh, they started getting a little bit better towards the end of his administration. But, uh, you know, I look at some of the people waiting in the wings for his administration, like the AFPI folks. Um, I'm not a big fan of that. So I have my concerns there. But you look at Ron DeSantis. Um, you know, if he's, he's an effective governor of Florida. But, you know, when it comes to foreign policy and some of the staffing of his administration on the federal, you know, when he's actually in, in federal office, I, I worry that he might put some of like the more traditional neocon types into office. So I, I don't know, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm conflicted on, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like a wait and see person. I kind of wait more towards the last minute and see how things are playing out. Like how's the economy doing? You know, what's uh, voter sentiment? And, you know, I, I, I want to see the debates play out. I want to see you know, these candidates get questions, so I can't really answer the, the question. Uh, just to be sure that everybody gets a chance to go to the restroom, I want to wrap this one up. Thank you guys very much. Cool.